Welcome to a special edition of Book Talk. The great convulsion that began a century ago reshaped the world, but the First World War was too big an event for any one story or single book to encompass it. So in this programme, aided by three eminent MPs, we'll be looking at accounts of the grand strategy of the war, how Parliament voted to join, and at the very personal politics of the Prime Minister who took us in. My guests today are the Labour MP Gisela Stewart, a member of the Commons Defence Select Committee, the Conservative MP and military historian Keith Simpson, and the former Lib Dem leader and foreign affairs specialist Sir Ming Campbell, a member of the government's advisory group on the commemoration of World War I. And Sir Ming, you've been looking at the military historian Gary Sheffield's short history of the First World War, and he starts in pretty much his opening bid is to pin the guilt for the war on German policy and on the Kaiser in particular. Is that a view you share? Well, remember, it's uh, the fact that Germany gave, the, the Kaiser gave, a sort of blank check to Austria-Hungary. And indeed, in the book, Gary Sheffield makes it plain that he regards both of these countries as having responsibility. Um, I think that's now pretty well become the conventional view, hasn't it? Uh, because the argument is that German expansionism was something which had we'd, we'd seen in the 19th century that there was no surprise that it was still a highly motivating feature in the early 20th century. The really interesting thing about this book is it describes it as an introductory history. But actually, when you read the detail which is produced, particularly on the way in which the war was fought, it's a long way from being introductory. Indeed, I think it's the kind of book that you would need to have a certain amount of knowledge in advance if you were going to make the most of it. Some of the more interesting things come in towards the end, when he talks about total war, the fact that you've got to win both at home uh, and abroad if you're going to succeed. And rather interestingly, he develops in a way I had not previously appreciated the evolution of air power to begin with, reconnaissance, uh, spotting uh, artillery on the other side, but very gradually evolving into something rather closer to the Royal Air Force that we understand today. Close air support, for example, when troops were on the ground. So. Although it's only about 180 pages, it certainly packs a very considerable punch. It's a fantastically de uh, detailed history for, for, as you say, for the, for the length of the thing. But, but Keith Simpson, I wanted to put it to you perhaps. Um, was it the case that even if the particular circumstances, the assassination of the Aus Austrian Archduke and so forth, hadn't happened, that sooner or later Europe was kind of poised on the brink and something would have tipped it over into a more general conflict, even if in not exactly the same way? I mean, sadly, there is this feeling that in nearly all the countries there was a sense of inevitability about it. There was sort of the Darwinian struggle. There were other areas where there could have been clashes. However, in the crises, and there were several crises in the decade before the First World War, diplomacy had succeeded in managing it. It was just that you finally had a catalyst and a decision by the Austro-Hungarians that they were going to crush the Serbs that started to bring in the other countries. And it is interesting what Ming was saying, um, that uh, you know there is this view that for, since the war guilt that the Germans were responsible, um, I think probably they, they had a, a, a lot of the onus was on them. But as a whole raft of uh, uh, historians, most particularly Christopher Clark at Cambridge University, who have spread the guilt further and say, for example, that the Russians showed a lack of constraint. And in fact, it's the, the Russian decision to partially mobilise mm. that starts off what AJP Taylor called the war the war by railway timetable. Mm -hmm. And Gisela, do you, do, you th do you agree that they were all basically heading for this conflict sooner or later, or was one party particularly pushing over the table in Europe? Well, I think probably the Kaiser, rather than the rest of the German government, has a lot of responsibility to take on that. And I think there certainly was a feeling that they sort of thought, well, if we're going to head for conflict, just let it get over and done with. I mean, this, the, we quite often assume that this notion that it'd all be over by Christmas was a very British notion. It, it was a very German notion, too, that they, that having sort of come out of 1870 quick wars, which you sort of go in and win, uh, the assumption was that, well, if trouble's brewing. And then probably within the German government collectively, <coughs> there was a real difficulty that the, the Kaiser himself really was not the most skilled of diplomats. <laughs> 
Pete Simpson, total war? Was it something that people were, as it were, politically prepared for? Did people realise that they may, may end up on rationing or on the verge of starvation in the combatant countries? I think some people did think that, but the majority, as Giza said, believed that it was going to be a short war, not just because of the most recent experience, but because they, they each believed that their um, campaign, their operational campaign, was going to knock the other mm. side out so quickly. For the first three or four months, it actually was a war of manoeuvre, certainly for the last six months, but even within that, there was there was attrition, but also we tend to think it's a world war. There were there were vast areas of manoeuvre on the Eastern Front. There was manoeuvre in the in the Middle East as well. And I suppose the the one thing I I, I feel about Gary's book, and I have to flag up that I I, I know him. He's a, he's an old friend. Is that if you were going to criticise it, you would say this is very much a a British Western Front. Yeah. A dominant. I mean, it's it's not entirely. That would be that would be unfair. Uh, and I think if you were to look at it as a world war, then you would have a, a perhaps a slightly different perspective. Yes, do, you, do you think that the the book catches enough of what was going on uh, on the home front, particularly in Germany, as as the as the blockade began to bite and the food shortages began to become a really crucial problem? In a sense, because it is such a short book, you know, there's only so much which you can. Can, can really cover, uh, and but but you raise something very interesting when you look at World War One from the from the German perspective, uh, because it was that generation like Konrad Adenauer who was mayor of Cologne in 1918 with all the soldiers coming back, the the, the lack of food and everything, and managing those refugee flows and population flows, who became that post World War Two generation in 1945, who actually brought Germany back on its feet. And of course, it's, I find it very interesting. We talk in the United Kingdom about World War One, uh, and it's uh, this very significant event for the Germans. It, 1914 was simply the beginning of 30 years of ghastly events. It's one big thing. Whereas for the UK, uh, it is that much more definitive in a sense. And I think that's what that to book to me captures, and things which you know the Middle East, size Pico, it looks the Balfour Declaration, looks the whole sort of things which we still have to live with today, but it does mention them. I think we've got to move on to our next book now, and this is <coughs> Fatal Fortnight, the uh, fight for British neutrality, uh, which focuses on the activities of a, a then Liberal backbench MP, Arthur Ponsonby, who was the chairman of the Liberals, gov uh, the governing party at the time, of course, uh, uh, backbench Foreign Affairs Committee. And he was one of a number of backbench MPs who tried, without any success, obviously, to avert the war, to try and stop the Liberal government entering the war. Uh, Keith Simpson, tell us all about it. I think it's a very interesting book, and, and it pleasantly surprised me. When I, I saw the blurb for it in advance, I thought, hmm, I'm not certain this is going to be that interesting. And I think it's interesting in, in a number of ways. The, the author, Duncan Marlow, has really gone into the archives. He's found a lot of collections of letters and diaries, of backbenchers, frontbenchers. He's actually read Hansard as well. And it is a combination of the very strong feeling within the Liberal Party who were, they weren't pacifists, but they were against the idea of an imperialist war. Uh, there is the fact that, that the Liberal Party then was a coalition, uh, not just between the imperialists and, if you like, the radicals, but of course it had relied upon uh, the Irish contingent and the independent par and parliamentary Labour Party. So it's about how, how they, they all changed and how uh, Asquith and Gray, the Foreign Secretary, were attempting to ride the crisis. Secondly, he brings out, because he really looks at specifically at a period from the 27th of July until the 6th of August, and I haven't seen anybody do it from a parliamentary political perspective. And he demonstrates there something we already knew, that even on the 27th of July, most people were far more concerned about a civil war in Ireland than they were about a, a regional conflict. Uh, so I thought it was, it was a, an excellent book. Uh, it showed how people really were torn. And it also, I think, as well, Mark, shows how people changed their mind. Josiah Wedgwood, uh, then a Liberal MP, later a Labour MP, as indeed was Ponsonby after 1918-19, having been somebody who was against the idea of getting into the war, when it came to uh, not, not the vote on the war, and I think this 
this, this resonates, thinking in terms of the Syria vote um, and the Iraq vote, that under the Royal Prerogative you didn't have to. All, all Gray did was come to the House of Commons, uh, presented a case and listened to the acclamation. The crucial vote was on the 6th of August, was for the estimates for the, for the war uh, money. Nobody voted against, but Ponsonby and others actually did speak against. Yeah. Geeks, though, reading those accounts, did you find this is what it was like for me in the various assorted votes that uh, in your parliamentary career you've seen where British troops have been sent to war or sent into action. Did the, the, were the vibrations the same? It is this extraordinary that, you know, hindsight is wonderful, you have, but you have to make a decision in, in a parliamentary mm -hmm. setting where uh, you have to rely on what you're being told. Uh, and if that's conflicting, then you know, and you have to go with your guts. But the other thing which is interesting about these votes is that it's probably the one area where party loyalty is the, the weakest in a sense, because when it comes to decisions of going to war, you have to be able to yourself to look in the mirror the next day. And it's because you have decided to do it, not because the whips told you or because you, you, your constituents told you. And whether it's World War One or when you look in or, you know, over the Suez Crisis, how, 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 how people voted in different ways, or, or mo most recently. But I was kind of interested in what was happening also to the Labour Party in that stage, because, uh, you know, and, and, and then halfway through uh, the World War One, you know, the Labour Party can't hold a coalition, and, 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 and Ramsay MacDonald has to go. Uh, and I think you had 42 Labour MPs at that stage uh, going into to that vote. Um, so I think it's an interesting parliamentary picture and could repeat itself. Well, let me bring in some Ming on yeah. this because your party famously voted against the uh, Iraq War in 2003. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ponsonby was very much against the First World War. <coughs> a certain amount of fellow feeling? <laughs> well, every case must be examined on its own merits. <laughs> is what politicians say when you ask them a question about consistency, don't they? Um, <coughs> Ponsonby, very interesting. Eton and Balliol, a real part of the establishment. Mm. Member of Parliament for Stirling, a Scottish constituency. Mm. Probably about 25 miles as the crow flies from the East Fife that Asquith represented, part of which is in my North East Fife. <coughs> and you'd have thought that he would be much more likely in those circumstances to be someone as about right behind the government and right behind Asquith. But I think it just illustrates what you were saying, the fact, I think Skeezler was saying, when it comes to this question of whether or not you should go to war, then that's the point at which members of parliament exercise independent judgment, or at least we hope they will always exercise independent judgment. He paid a price, Ponsonby, of course, uh, because as the... Um, enthusiasm built, then he became less and less acceptable. And in fact, he was deselected in 1916 in his own constituency of Stirling, and subsequently, as I think we've heard already, uh, joined the Labour Party and I think was leader of the opposition in the House of Lords during a Labour government. So for him, it was an enormous watershed. Now, uh, when <coughs> the Liberal government was taken to war, it was expertly managed into that position by uh, Herbert Henry Asquith, the then Prime Minister. And we ha are extremely lucky to have through the book that you've been looking at, Gisela, um, a very inside account of his wartime career, because he lasted the best part of two years as a wartime Prime Minister after that event. His talents as a political manager meant that he didn't end up with some sort of terminal cabinet split as he took the Liberal government into war. But those same talents as a political manager were not what was then needed, mm. according to some analysis, of the end of his mm. premiership. This was a, a man who'd been a brilliant sort of political tactician, but wasn't necessarily made as a wartime leader. And uh, his wife, Margot Asquith, details all that in the absolutely fascinating and newly edited set of diaries. Uh, what did you learn about him and indeed about her in there? Well, you know, the, she was... Ask a uh, second wife, and she, you know, inherited five stepchildren, one of which uh, Raymond dies uh, during the, the, the war. Uh, but she's quite an extraordinary figure because uh, I think someone said, it, it, "Nice people don't write interesting diaries," and hers is a Alan uh, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hers are very interesting, and she can be terribly acerbic. And there were times when I thought, "Would I actually want to spend dinner with her?" And I thought, mm. "No, actually, I wouldn't." <laughs> Uh, she sort of goes off at night and, and writes her diary and she, she talks to, 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 to her husband and I think they sort of go to their separate bedrooms and she, she kind of writes in a sense as almost as if she's watching a stage, terribly perceptive at times, 
but at other times, I don't think she ever worked out what the role of a prime minister's wife was meant to be during something as uh, significant as, 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 as a great war. So she, she, she thinks it's quite strange when the palace, you know, when the king says he's going to give up alcohol for the duration uh, of the war, but she insists of her daughter, you know, stepdaughter having a very, uh, with all pop and, uh, pomp and circumstance wedding. Uh, she, she's terribly against conscription and keeps telling her husband so that she's against this. Uh, but as you as you go through this, uh, she makes very political observations, and I just suddenly thought, if you had had Sherry Blair's diaries with the kind of highly political comments she makes and the advice, very opinionated advice she gives her husband, uh, we would say, surely, no, she didn't know her place. Whereas with <laughs> with Margot Asquith, we kind of accept it. Well, it, uh, it was another time, of course. I mean, but, in, but indeed, uh, but it was a time when you would expect women actually not to be quite yeah. as forceful. Yeah. And some of, some of her judgments uh, are quite interesting. I mean, about Ch Churchill, she yeah. says he either's go he's, he's either going to be killed in the war, uh, or his political career will go absolutely nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a fascinatingly different political world, though. As Ming says as well, you you have you know almost government from drawing rooms and country yeah. house weekends and a, a top echelon of politics who all know each other very well and known each other all their lives. Keith, it's a different different. Yes, existence. I mean it's a, it's a Victorian Edwardian world, and I mean it is Downton Abbey in one sense. And the thing that misses, is missing from Downton Abbey is, is is the sort of the great ladies who control things from behind mm. the scenes. The, the trouble is um, about uh, uh, Mrs Asquith, of course, was that she was resented because she was bourgeois um, and her money came from trade and business. Uh, and she was so upfront and indiscreet. But I think, I mean, it's fascinating because we actually know a lot about the Asquith government because not only were so many people keeping diaries, but it was possible to write letters six times a day in London. They would be delivered in an hour. As, as, as Asquith did to Venetia Stanley, <laughs> yes. who doesn't really get a mention in the diaries. No, you wouldn't expect I, 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 I mean, we've, that, we've, tend, we've, tended, we've tended to traduce Lloyd George, but Asquith, I've always thought, was a fumble rather than anything else. And the, the serious fact of this is that he looked for sympathy and uh, support and companionship, which she, Margot, doesn't really give him, mm. uh, but these young ladies, and as a historian, thank God. I mean, he's writing letters, uh, admittedly not, not that many, but in the middle of Canada. <laughs> he's writing during a debate on, on what, to, what to do with the Dardanelles, and he says, my darling, I'm going to have to stop the letter now Kitchener and Churchill have had a row, and I must calm them down. I mean, you can imagine David Cameron saying, my dear, to somebody. You know, there's a row going on between Nick Clegg and Ian Duncan Smith. I'm just... <laughs> yes, <laughs> dear Sam. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ming, would it have been the case, though, that Asquith by this stage was somewhat past his sell-by date as Prime yeah. Minister? The, yeah, well, the... I have to be very careful, because a lot of... Bonham Carter's still around. <laughs> the <Liberal laughs> You've got three Asquiths in the House of Lords yeah, now. So I, I have to be very careful. <laughs> I mean, the, the word squiffy was, of course, coined for him because, yeah. uh, mm. as they say in Scotland, perhaps, he, he, he liked a good drink. Mm. Uh, and I think there were quite a lot of occasions when he was under the influence. Um, Margot Tennant, she was from Scotland, a strong Scottish theme running through mm -hmm. this, Margot Tennant. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the property in the borders is still owned by the tenant that she came from, still owned by the Tennant family. What I think is most extraordinary, I'm slightly irritated by some of this, because it was the marriage together uh, of what were very serious uh, events, uh, serious decisions, and social life. Mm. And, and the house parties went on, and sometimes, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the two oppositions were in the same house party, and there's one point at which she fell out enormously badly with Curzon, because Curzon had a ball and didn't invite her to it. The horror, the horror. Well, exactly. Well, perhaps in Edwardian England that, that was a very, very serious <laughs> blow, I, I mean, I think the blow, blow to seven. And one last point, yes. if I may. She went to the House of Commons all the time. Yeah, pretty well. In the ladies' gallery, yes, behind the... Pretty well. Every time Asquith went, and she was there, and immediately afterwards, if you made a statement or a speech, she went round to his room and discussed it with him. But the moment when the personal and the political collided in a rather more horrible way, and it's 
brilliantly and poignantly described in this book is the moment when Margot has to go and tell Asquith mm. yeah. that, her, that his son Raymond has been killed mm. on the front. I, I suppose it's worth noting that most of the wartime leaders had sons at the front. Bonalor's uh, yeah. sons died mm. as well, a mm. conservative leader in the coalition of the time. But th was that perhaps the moment when Asquith's resolve cracked because his premiership didn't last a great deal longer after that? I mean, I, I don't know, kind of second-guessing when he cracked, but I didn't feel that, she, from her diary entry, that she fully understood yeah, the, yeah. the significance of that. It, I think it's a rather odd entry, yeah. uh, as she tells him. Uh, but at other times, she's much more insightful than he is, like the, when, when Lloyd George in 1916 accepts the, 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 the cabinet position. She, she says, this is us yeah, out yeah. of Downing Street, yeah. whereas Asquith himself thought he could go on much longer. Uh, I'm not sure whether he... I, I, I get the sense that the great skill of the manager who keeps hold, holding things together, he was worn down by the fact that he, he yeah. was meant to make decisions and this wasn't a man to make decisions. I mean, I wondered if he'd had a kind of what we now call a nervous breakdown. I mean, there is a part of the diaries in which he is immensely unwell and cannot be rallied and all the rest. And then he does rally eventually. But I wondered if, yeah. if, he had, if there was something which nowadays you might describe in those terms. Well, I mean, Gray did. About, I mean, he kind of fell apart. Yeah, we talk he? about stress. I mean, you know, when you think about it, Churchill had at least one heart attack during the Second World War and, and recovered, and he, he, yeah, got, the, he got the, you know, the black, the black yeah. dog. But with Asquith, I, in a strange way, I think he suffered the double blow. It was when, of course, uh, Venetia Henley, the young woman, and she says that she's going Stanley. to marry uh, Stanley, a member of his cabinet. That seems to have been as big a shock to him yeah. as losing his yeah. son. And, um, and, the, and the sort of palace coup that displaced him comes not long after these two blows have fallen. And, and there's a sort of huge intrigue, and somehow uh, Asquith is out and Lloyd George is in, and the whole tenor of the war administration well, I, think, I think it's the editors who, are, who, who edited the, the Asquith, Venetia, Stanley letters should be complimented. I mean, mm. it's about a hundred page introduction, yeah. but it puts everything yeah. beautifully yeah. into context. Mm. They make the point, and I think it comes out easily with Margaret Asquith's diaries, that she and her husband just couldn't actually understand how the world had changed yeah. at every level, political, yeah. military, and the biggest error he made of all was to so basically say in December 1916, I shall stand down with the majority of my cabinet, Lloyd George will never be able to form a government. Mm -hmm. And he, he does. He does mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're running, I'm afraid, rapidly out of time, but I thought just a moment to give a, a, a few final thoughts about what that war did to our politics, how it changed perhaps the way we saw ourselves as a country, amongst other things, in the sort of backwash of all this. Ireland was in the process of getting out of the United Kingdom. Uh, Samin, what's your verdict? There's a kind of flavour of Downton Abbey about all this because yeah. if you watch the program you'll see that very very gradually these issues begin to uh, arise in the lives both of the people upstairs and the people downstairs if I can take a rather narrow view it made an enormous difference to the Liberal Party because the feud between Lloyd George and Asquith and their adherents went on for a very long time and uh, gave rise ultimately in 1945 to the virtual annihilation of the Liberal Party and that famous music hall joke, the punchline of which was, and the Liberal lost its deposit. I mean, it did have an enormous impact on the party in a way from which it has always been difficult to recover. Gisela. The United States of America. Uh, that entry into as an economic power has to become a military power. And in, in the... It's, in, in the Asquith diaries, you have, you know, it, to begin with, it's not obvious that Woodrow Wilson actually wanted Germany to lose uh, or which side they were going to be on. And it was the beginning of the, 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 the American engagement within Europe, which then, of course, went, they went into isolationist mode again and then had to come out again in World War II. And it's that which I think is really important. Thank okay. you. I think the great irony is that at the time of the armistice and the peace conference the British Empire was at its greatest extent. We mm -hmm. appeared superficially to have been probably the biggest victor and yet the seeds of uh, the decline were, were there, we owed so much money to the Americans, we'd been traumatised by the losses which were not as bad as most of the other countries and I would say in addition to the, the Americans it, it, is, it is the success of the Bolsheviks in taking over Russia and the international perspective of that, which then dominates uh, 
British politics, yeah. for better or for worse, with National Socialism yeah. and Fascism in what we call the interwar period. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. It's been a fascinating and sobering discussion. My thanks to our guests on this special edition of Book Talks, Simon Campbell, Gisela Stewart and Keith Simpson. And from all of us here, goodbye. <laughs>